Hey everybody, Brian Goulet here of GouletPens.com and it's episode number 251 of Goulet Q&A. Just past Easter this week, uh, had a very just crammed family life last week. You know, Rachel and I went to church a whole bunch of times. I mentioned to you that um, we were going to be doing that, but uh, we ran through the gauntlet, so to speak, and uh, came out the other side. Uh, it was very, it was very inspiring, actually. It's kind of things like, just like any type of volunteer service or anything like that. It's usually like, the more you give, the more you get back, kind of thing. So even though we we gave a lot of our time, it was actually very rewarding and got to spend some good time with our kids, good time with my parents, um, and uh, it was really, it was very just like fulfilling on a personal level to be able to spend that much family time as we did. Uh, so had to put some like work stuff on the back burner a little bit, but now we're kind of through that, catching up a little bit. And uh, yeah, so it's gonna be a little crazy. But anyway, um, what else we got going on? So in this video, I'm gonna be talking about a few different things. Uh, I think I have eight questions for you here today. Eight, yeah. Um, talk about sharing pens with your spouse, whether that's wise. Uh, who should use fountain pens and then special edition availability and part of what's prompting some of this is we have had some special edition pens come out in the last week or so one of which is the Lamy Safari pastels I don't think technically pastels in the name but that's what we're referring it to internally and probably a lot of you are too um, I know we had one question it's not an official question but we did have some people curious as to which ones are selling the best so we've had these for uh, not all that long less than a week well not about a week now after we've launch this video, but uh, the number one seller has been the Blue Macaron, and then the Powder Rose, and then the Mint Glaze after that. So um, the blue and the pink are actually fairly close to each other, but uh, has edged it out a little bit. You know, of course, blue's my favorite color, so I'm like, yeah. But uh, I don't know, I kind of dig them all. The pink is usually not like my go-to kind of color, but um, actually as I'm like looking at it, the pink is almost like very, very close to this Twisby Eco, um, you know, pastel pink that we've had here in the past. So it is kind of interesting to see um, just the variety of pens. I've got a lot of pens down here to show you today. Uh, but anyway, so we got those Lamy's um, and uh, we do have a question about the availability, which I'll cover in a minute. Uh, the Banu Titan is another pen that we like to throw on the desk. Uh, the Benu Titan. Drew and I talked about this and right now on Wednesday, so you can get more details about that there. Uh, plus, I talked about it last week. So I won't exhaust it. Um, but anyway, that is happening. You know, it's kind of thing like we never know. So just just so you know, just kind of the, the dialogue that happens internally here with Goulet Pens. Whenever we have like an exclusive like this, and then there's like a Twisby launch, a Lamy launch, something like that. We're always torn because on one hand, you know, we had the Lamy Safari pastels last week. On one hand, we're like, a lot of people are gonna be interested in these pens. We should try to launch whatever other things that we can so people can combine and stuff like that. But honestly, I think what ends up happening is stuff like this gets overshadowed uh, when there's so much attention going to some other thing. So we're talking about, you know, how we can do that better uh, in the future, but uh, in any case, we have plenty of the um, safaris, so those I don't expect are going to run out right away. We still have a good number of titans as well, so I think if you were like freaking out thinking like, oh my gosh, I only have a couple of days to get either of these, maybe not so much freak out mode on these two. Um, the safaris are probably going to be available for, you know, months and months and months. The titan, it's a one run kind of thing, so once we get low and get out, that's going to be it. Uh, so more on that in a minute because that is one of the questions for this week. Uh, and then the other big thing that we had was the Twisby Eco Orange. And I'll show you this thing up close. It's a, it's actually a really nice color. I, I like the orange uh, thing. It's, it's a little bit more of an amber uh, than what I was initially expecting. So it did kind of take me by surprise, but I will say it's grown on me like very, very quickly. Initially, I was thinking it was going to be maybe a little more of like a blaze orange or something. I don't know what I was thinking. Orange is one of those really difficult colors to photograph. So I wasn't really, I didn't really know what to expect when it came in. Um, but when I see it next to the other eco transparent colors, which I have all of them, I believe, um, they, they actually look, it actually looks really nice. It kind of falls in line with the color scheme, very much of a rainbowy kind of pattern here. Um, so yeah, I'm curious to see what other colors they come out with in the future to complement these. Um, but good, good call on the amber. Not sure, not the amber. Jeez, I want to call it the amber, um, but it's actually orange. The other eco. See, I've got, I'm trying to show you all my ecos. I was like, oh, I'm just going to show them all. I'll grab them all for you here today. But boom, 
there you go. Can you see all those? These are all the Ecos I have. Not even the Eco T. This is just the Ecos that I have. And I think I have my black one at home even. So I'm now realizing I have a dozen Ecos personally. So I think I think I have an Eco problem. But anyway, or you could say I'm very Eco-friendly. <laughs> Couldn't resist. Anyway, so there's that. Uh, so that's new. The Eco is the kind of thing like we're probably gonna clear out of most of those. And then I, it's tough. We never know exactly how many more we're getting and if and when and that kind of thing. So Twisby is a one where you got to hit on it a little bit quicker, but I, I, they've been much better about restocking the transparent Ecos especially. So I'm expecting that we're going to get more. I just don't know exactly when. So if it goes out of stock, don't freak out too much. Sign up for the email notification because I'm sure this is how you do it. Uh, and then you'll be in good shape. Cool. All right, pen and writing questions for this week. First one is from BB Ducky on Instagram. I don't know if that's how you say it, but BBDCKY. Is it okay to share fountain pens long term? My husband and I share our fountain pen collection, but I heard the nibs conform to the writer. How will sharing affect the nibs? Okay, so this kind of touches on, you know, uh, sort of a myth. Uh, which I talked about in the fountain pen myths video that I did a little while ago, if you remember that one. If you haven't, go check it out. Um, that letting other people borrow your fountain pens will somehow ruin them or that they like they conform to every writer. It's this very romantic sounding thing like you you build this, you know, personal relationship with the feel of your nib and if somebody else even so much signs their name with it, it'll it'll just ruin all the relationship you built with your pen. That's really not the case. You know, you think about like these fountain pen nibs, they are made out of metal, right? Like these are made to last decades. So letting one person borrow it and sign it for something for a little bit, unless they're abusing the nib, like mashing it, destroying it, just borrowing it and writing something with it, it's not gonna like undo all this like, you know, your, your fountain pen's not this like fragile little flower that if somebody else touches it, it's gonna wither away. You know, these are, these are you know, sturdy pieces of metal that are made to take a lot, a lot of writing. So, you know, I'll nuance that to say that if you're writing consistently with one pen, eventually it'll kind of wear away like a little bit of a flat spot. Um, or, you know, it's like if you have a fountain pen nib and it's not like perfectly tuned, you can wear away, excuse me, any burrs or edges or things like that. Ooh, sorry. Uh, you can, you can like kind of wear that away as you're using it in one particular spot and it'll kind of feel better for you as you're writing in that spot. And then if somebody else holds it at a different angle or something like that, if there's a wear spot on it, then maybe it won't be as comfortable there, but they're not really going to ruin it. And then like you get it back and it doesn't write the same. So, you know, I, I personally think that is total bunk. Um, but anyway, um, you know, over time, the tipping can sort of break into an individual writer. But honestly, if, if you're letting, if you're sharing it with your, your husband, your spouse, or whomever else in your life, uh, if they are writing with it in a slightly different style than you, I actually, I don't view that as a bad thing, quite honestly, because if you are using a fountain pen and you're like, you know, burning one, you're like burning it up in one spot, somebody else holding it in a slightly different spot, it's actually going to help to round out the nib a little bit and keep it from really getting one flat spot. So I actually think it's a little better, um, honestly. As long as you are not falling into a couple of pitfalls, which I think could happen. One is you want to make sure that you both like understand how to use them and, and you're not abusing and like, you know, especially like some people have much harder writing pressure than others. So if you are using a nib and it's like, you know, a pen of yours and it has a soft nib and you write with it too hard and that can spring the tines, that's not necessarily good. So you'd want to make sure that whoever you're sharing with has an understanding of every nib that you're buying and how it should be used. Uh, the, uh, the other flip side of it is anytime you're sharing something like that, you may not know what ink was used in it or if it seemed like it was out of ink, you maybe thought it was clean, but you ink it up with something else and you end up mixing the ink or you end up not cleaning it for an extended period of time because you think that somebody else is taking care of it. So it's, it's more just keeping the proper maintenance aspect of the pen under control if you're sharing pens back and forth a lot. But honestly, I don't really see too many risks as long as there's just a little bit of understanding, a little bit of communication, just like any relationship. Um, as long as you're on the same page, you should be able to uh, enjoy, not only enjoy uh, sharing the pens, but you can, you can, 
sort of enable each other a little bit. I mean, you're going to know, like, if you get, like, pens as gifts or whatever, you're going to know more intimately what they like. And, you know, it's also uh, beneficial because you're essentially, like, doubling the the pen collection that you get to enjoy, right? Because, you know, it's like Rachel has her own pens that she enjoys, and, you know, I may want to use something that she's got. So if I need to borrow a pen or, you know, just kind of take one, uh, I can do that with her, and she can do that with me, and, you know, everybody's happy. So... Uh, I don't view it as something to be afraid of personally. Other people may feel differently, but I think as long as you're communicating, you're going to be just fine, if not happier. Okay. Brett M. on Facebook says, Recently, I tried the Platinum Procyon, and it has become my favorite pen. I'm interested in some of the other Platinums. Usually, when discussing Japanese pens, I hear a lot about Pilot, how would you compare the Plazier to the Metropolitan and the 3776 to the Custom 74? Why would one choose one over the other? Thank you for your help and all you do. Well, you're very welcome, Brett. Um, Procyon. I don't have a Procyon at the ready. But you didn't really ask about the Procyon. You already have one. You love it. Okay, cool. Great. Happy for you. It's a solid pen. I enjoy it very much. Um, you asked about the Metropo the Plazier to the Metropolitan, okay? So most of the Plaziers, this particular one that I am showing is the Bali Citrus, which is a special edition because I'm mean like that and I like to show things that you can't get forever in Q&A. Um, this is Bali Citrus, uh, and it is, you know, representative of the fit and finish that you'll see on a Plazier. Now, a Plazier essentially is a platinum preppy uh, grip on an aluminum body. So the Preppy is just a plastic pen. I should have grabbed the Preppy for you, but oh well. Uh, Platinum Preppy, same grip, same nib setup, but it's going to have a plastic body instead of the metal. So it's, it's basically a more durable version of a Preppy. Still has a really great cap seal, nice snap to it, reliable writer, lots of great things going on. Uh, it's got the aluminum body, so I wouldn't recommend eyedropper converting the Plazier. That's kind of, if you like to eyedropper the Preppy, whoops, then, uh, sorry, I've got like landscapers out here, like leaf blowers outside my office. If I seem a little distracted, that's why. I'm not sure if you can hear it or not, but anyway, that's happening. Um, anyway, so you can't really eyedropper convert this coming up from the Preppy, but the writing experience will be very similar, very positive. The Metropolitan itself, um, instead of having an aluminum body like the Plazier has, has a brass body, so it's a little heavier. So you're looking at about 19 gram weight for the Plazier, 26 gram weight for the Metropolitan. So it's a little bit heavier. That may be good or not for you. I don't know how heavy you like your pens to be, but it is something to take into consideration. If you're one of those people that you feel like having more weight to something denotes more quality, then the Metropolitan is gonna seem more quality to you, even though they're actually both really good fit and finish. Um, because this is aluminum, aluminum is not quite as durable as uh, brass, so you can, if you're tossing around your plazier like a lot, you can ding and dent it uh, a little bit, just like you could with any aluminum pen, probably about the same as like a Lamy All-Star. Maybe, I don't know, it's hard to tell how the thickness of this is. It's slick, so that kind of throws me off a little bit. But um, anyway, the colors on the plazier are really good. The nibs are going to be, um, uh, to me, the nibs seem a little more substantial on the Metropolitan. And uh, you still get the same fine and medium options on both pens. Uh, it just depends. Do you like the slightly smoother nib of the Metropolitan or the somewhat toothier nib of uh, Platinum? Platinum seems to have their nibs be just a little bit toothier, um, just in general, uh, on these. So um, some things to take in consideration there. You're looking under $20 on this, just over $20 on this. So it's a few dollars difference between the two. The plus side, though, is that the pilot comes with the converter on the inside, whereas you would need to buy the converter for the Plazier, unless you're going to use cartridges with it. So by the time you add a converter to a Plazier, that actually puts you a couple of bucks over a Metropolitan. So it, it ends up being somewhat comparable between the two, but there's good color options between them, and a lot of it depends on how do you like the writing experience, how do you like the weight. But they're both really good Japanese quality, nice looking pens. I love them both. But the Metropolitan is like by far more popular than the Plazier. I don't know why. I don't know why that is. I guess people think because the grip of the Plazier is too much like a Preppy, they're like, why would I pay more for what's basically a Preppy? Like I get that, but I mean the rest of the pen, like obviously there's cost involved and 
producing a metal body instead of a plastic one. So the cost in my mind is completely justified, but I think in most people's mind, they're gonna get just some multiple preppies instead of a plazier. So um, that's why it's not quite as popular. Um, and the thing I will say, most of the finishes on the plazier are shiny like this. We do have the uh, Black Mist, uh, which is a special edition on the plazier, and that has a matte finish to it, which really makes it much more comparable to the Metropolitan because that matte finish is almost identical to the Metropolitan finish. So anyway, that's a thing. And then the other thing you asked about was, how does a 3776 Platinum compare to a Pilot Custom 74? And that is tough because they're both really good pens. Um, so now we're both into gold nib territory with these ones. Um, really, really solid writers, great performing, Japanese quality. Just, I mean, I'm a huge fan of both of these. Uh, the Custom 74 was my first gold nib I ever had, so I'm a little bit partial to that. But I had 3776 not too, too long after this. Um, both really nice pens. The nib on the 3776 is slightly bigger, so aesthetically, you know, if you're into a slightly bigger nib, um, that's kind of nice. So you can see there, ta-da! I mean, I don't know, visually, if you kind of like the look of it a little bit better, but it does look a little bigger. The Custom 74 is more of a number five size, and the Platinum is more of a number six size, even though they both make their own nibs in-house, so they're not really interchangeable with any other brand nibs. Uh, what else we got here? So the overall style of it is somewhat similar. I think the, you know, the Platinum probably looks just a little, a little more professional of sorts. You know, I don't know whether it's just the center band or whatever. Um, maybe the, just the color is a little more opaque, a little darker. Um, you know, the, it, it's, it's really just a matter of opinion. Um, but to me, it just seems somewhat more professional, but really, I mean, they're both pretty similar. It's slight, ever so slightly fatter. Um, not a huge noticeable difference between the two, but you, you do get a little more girth on the Customs, uh, sorry, 3776. Um, nib options are going to be somewhat similar. Uh, the difference is, the biggest difference is gonna be uh, two main things. So um, they both have pretty good sealing caps. The Custom 74, it's gonna seal really well. The 3776 has the slip and seal cap, which they say uh, will seal your nib and keep it wet for up to two years. So whether or not you need, you know, if you really need to keep it sealed, 3776 is great for that. Custom 74 though, I've never had a problem. You're gonna get more ink capacity on the Custom 74 because it's got that Con 70 converter in it, which is a pain to clean, but it does get a higher ink capacity. So I do like that. That's a huge plus for me, but it's also kind of a pain to clean that converter out. And then they both have proprietary cartridges and converters, so that's kind of a wash there uh, in terms of, you know, your, your usability options and stuff like that. The biggest difference, though, in my opinion, is the way that they feel when they write. The Pilot Custom 74 is going to have, they both have 14 karat gold nibs, but the Pilot, whatever it is about the way they make their nibs, um, it's got a little more spring to it. Um, the, the 3776, actually, one thing Platinum is, is kind of proud of is the amount of gold content they have in their nibs. Um, you know, so I think they're thicker nibs, they're somewhat stiffer nibs, um, so they're going to write a little stiffer and, and just be a little bit toothier than the Pilot nibs. So if you like smoother, springier, you know, gold nib type experience, that's where Pilot shines. 3776 has a very kind of specific feel to it that's kind of unique to platinum, a little toothier, a little stiffer. Um, if you go with a platinum soft nib, that actually is gonna feel a little bit more like a regular Pilot nib. Um, so it's really a matter of preference in terms of style and some of these key features and all that. Prices are gonna be somewhat comparable, pretty close to each other here, um, but, but again, both great pens, both really good quality made in Japan. It's gonna be kind of a toss up a little bit. There you go. All right, Mito N on Facebook asked, who do you think would benefit the most from fountain pens in this day and age that aren't regularly interacting with them? And this is a really great question. Uh, first off, I'm kind of like on a mission to get uh, fountain pens in everybody's hands who uh, has any interest in them whatsoever, even if they don't know it yet. Uh, so I would kind of say everyone, but 
That's that seems like a bit of a cop out answer. Um, obviously, you know, whoever's interested in them should use them, uh, even if they haven't interacted with them yet. I was one of those individuals. I'd never in, had never used a fountain pen before, and then when I did, I was just like, ah, oh, where has this been all my life? You know, and I just had no awareness of it. So that's that's almost easy because you know you got people who kind of want that and they just haven't discovered it yet. Um, but I would say that um, there are probably people out there who maybe just inherently wouldn't be like total fountain pen like you know, enthusiasts like me, but, um, you know, maybe like have certain uses that they could have for pens that would, that would, um, be really beneficial to their life. And so I'm going to touch on those here. I would say any like working professional, you know, I have more or less an office job myself. Um, you know, I think that they work really well for just making, the day to day, especially if you have meeting after meeting after meeting, you're going to work conferences and things like that. It just makes the experience of writing things down more interesting. You can put a little personality into it. You can be thoughtful about, I'm going to bring this pen, that pen, that pen. And it just adds a little bit of flavor to your life in what is normally a somewhat mundane activity like, you know, working in a cubicle or going to meetings. Um, you know, I think that they make great conversation starters. You know, for me especially, I'm in, I'm I'm very biased because I'm in the pen business. So any business meeting that I have is obviously about pens. Um, but even still, even with people that I'm, you know, meeting with that don't really know anything about pens or just don't really care about the specific products I sell, but that we're just talking general business stuff, um, they're always kind of interested to see if I have a, you know, you know, like this. Twisby Eco. If I have a pen like this, this doesn't look like every other pen that you would have. People are like, what is that all about? And you can see the ink sloshing around. It's a good conversation starter and I can talk about all that kind of stuff. And it seems to kind of cap capture people's interest, even if they're not like, oh yeah, I want to use one. They're like, oh, okay, that seems like too much work, but I can get why people are interested in it. You know, so it's kind of a good conversation starter. Um, students, teachers, anybody who's like, you know, has writing as a part of their regular life, their curriculum, uh, could benefit a lot from fountain pens. Not even just necessarily from the aspect that it, you know, what a fountain pen is, but it's just the fact that it doesn't take as much pressure to write. So if you're writing for long periods of time, long notes and stuff like that, uh, it can really help to keep your hand from cramping. It can be very economical for writing lots of notes, um, better for the environment. You're not burning through as many disposable pens and these types of things. Um, you know, and along those lines, anybody who writes really with any type of profession, if you're an author, cartoonist, illustrator, architect, these types of things, and you're using pens on a regular basis, a lot of those people like to enjoy pens, not just because it's tactile and they enjoy it, but like it can actually be better for their hands. Um, also people who have uh, hand conditions like arthritis or um, tendonitis or anything where like gripping something and pressing is really painful and kind of hard, um, having a fountain pen, uh, especially a light, larger fountain pen can actually be really therapeutic and very good. Um, for being able to write there. Um, and then s not specifically to the fountain pens themselves necessarily, but um, there's a lot of people who I know that use fountain pens in the, in the context of journaling, um, whether it's like a gratitude journal or um, as almost kind of a therapy for helping with anxiety, depression, uh, these types of things, recovery, uh, counseling. You know, there's a, there's a lot that can be said to having intentionality around the writing products you use to help you to um, have the discipline of writing on a regular basis, like something if you, you know, um, are, are trying to, you know, work through any of these challenges that I'm talking about here. Uh, it can actually be really therapeutic and really beneficial to do these things. And a fountain pen can be one tool that goes into the mix. So um, not that you have to use that, but it, it can certainly add to the enjoyment of it. Um, and so that can be really great. Uh, and then for me, like as a, as a business person, as like an entrepreneur, the like goal setting, uh, mind mapping, you know, bullet journaling, these types of things, like a productivity oriented um, aspect, I think fountain pens are really helpful. For one, if you're in a business setting, you can like pick a pen and an ink that like matches your colors, it's on brand, it's like I'm, I'm all into blue, so I have a lot of blue ink, a lot of blue pens, so that, you know, when I'm, when I'm using a blue pen, it just, it gets me in the frame of like, okay, my business, blue, boom, it can kind of get me excited in that way. Um, not that you couldn't have that with a rollerball or a ballpoint, but you know, for fountain pens, that could be one aspect of it. You can match the ink closer too. Um, you know, but also just um, anything where there's like decision making and stuff like that involved, fountain pens for me at least, um, 
you know, help to motivate me. I, I want to use them and I think they're cool and fun and I like to, to do them. So I'm more apt to pick up a pen and, and uh, jot notes or, or things like that. And I especially find it helpful when I have um, business meetings and stuff with people uh, rather than pulling on my laptop or a phone. Phone is like the worst. If I'm at a business meeting with somebody, especially somebody that I have just kind of met or I'm getting to know better, like on a personal level, the last thing, and I, and I don't have a great, great memory for details, so I have to write a lot down. Um, and so it's a real challenge for me when I, all I have is with me is my phone, because as I'm talking to someone, I'm like on my phone. I'm not a great multitasker either, so I can't really look at somebody and then type on my phone at the same time. So as somebody's like telling me something really important about them that I want to remember, I try to engage with them with eye contact and that's really hard when I'm on my phone and then I get a notification and then it dings and you know it's like it just is very discourteous um, whereas there's something different about just having a notebook writing down a note here and there I find that I can actually hand write and look at somebody in the eye easier than I can type because I can't I have no sense of like where my fingers are on the phone you know especially with the integrated keyboard into the screen um, but when I'm when I'm writing with my hand uh, I'm, I'm a little bit better at it so I don't know that's just a weird thing for me um, but yeah and then just there's a whole technical aspect to the pens like in terms of how they develop the history behind them the cultures of where these pens come from um, especially if you get into like vintage pens oh my gosh there's so much history and you know world war you know uh, technology that affected the production of different pens and the, all these types of there's all kinds of crazy stuff different materials the chemistry and physics behind how ink flows and all that there's a lot of that kind of cool stuff that can um, really feed into the enjoyment of pens as well. So there's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot in there that that people can latch on to. That's why I think you see such um, kind of a diversity of, of interest and in people and careers and age and and you know geography um, that makes up the fountain pen community, which I think is just the coolest. All right. Ink question now. So this is from Meg S on Facebook. I've fallen in love with sheening inks. But I also like to use inks that are permanent. Are there any inks out there with both qualities? Are there any sheening and permanent inks I can mix together to create one with both qualities? Or am I doomed to pick one or the other? Okay. Um, Meg, I looked through all of the, the ink that we have, uh, especially all the water resistant ones and permanent ones. And sadly, I don't think there are any really particularly good sheening inks that are also permanent. Uh, and part of that, I think, has to do with the particular properties that make each do their thing. Sheening ink basically needs to like pool on the surface of the paper and kind of like not naturally absorb into the paper. Otherwise, it like wipes out the sheen. Uh, permanent ink is pretty much the opposite. It needs to absorb into the paper. Um, especially if you want it to be very, very permanent, then it really absorbs in and doesn't leave anything on top so it won't smear and anything like that. So it's kind of two different things you're asking for there a little bit. Um, so I looked through the whole list. I really didn't see a single one. Um, there's some that like, okay, maybe this could sheen under the right circumstances if it really put a lot down, but like it's not, there's not a single permanent ink that we have at Gilead Pens that I would call a sheening ink. Um, now, the mixing thing, I think, is really intriguing. And honestly, if I had more time, I would experiment with that. But that could be something to try playing with. Could you mix like a Noodler's Periwinkle with a Diamine Majestic Blue? If they're two like blues, could you get the permanent and the, the sheen? I don't know. My guess is that you'd probably get a dilution effect of the two if you mix them together. But it could be worth a shot. All right, next question we have is... is well, I got a few business questions, actually. Mm, the next four are business questions. All right, so let's do it. Pickled Kiwi on Instagram. Why is Keras Customs not being carried on GouletPens.com anymore? Uh, I think this is a good question. We do get asked from time to time, like, hey, I noticed this brand isn't around or this model isn't around or whatever. We, we will pick up and discontinue things on a pretty regular basis. Uh, as far as like pen colors, models, ink, notebook types, th those types of things, that's very normal. Um, you know, this is a retail business and we have to cycle things in and out. There's a life cycle for every product. Not everything is popular all the time. Even you look at products like the 
you know, Parker 51 or, you know, whatever. There's there like iconic pens and things like that that do stick around for a long time, but there's an ebb and a flow to everything and everything has its time. That said, um, you know, with Keras, it, with Keras Customs, like it's, it's more rare for us to stop carrying an entire brand. There's a couple different reasons why it can happen. Sometimes it's because uh, the manufacturer goes out of business, like Omos, for example. They just belly up, they're gone, close, Delta, same situation. Uh, and that can happen, and that's usually pretty sudden. Sometimes it's just stock dwindles forever, and you're like, hey, why aren't you shipping anything? What's going on? You hear rumors, and then all of a sudden you hear, okay, they close their doors. Um, that kind of thing can happen. Uh, the uh, other situations we have is, you know, a manufacturer can, you know, just kind of make a shift, make a change. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of different ways to sell pens. You can sell through retailers, you can sell direct, you can, you know, um, do Kickstarter stuff. There's a lot of different methods um, of which people can sell stuff. Um, you can do shows, you can do, you know, physical brick and mortar stores only and not do online. So sometimes there are, you know, strategic decisions that a manufacturer will make based on how they want to position themselves and all that. Sometimes we fit into that mix, sometimes we don't. So, you know, Mont Blanc, for example, a lot of you ask about them all the time. They don't want to sell to online only stores. You know, I've had conversations uh, with them before and they're like, no, if you want to set up a brick and mortar store, we'd be more than happy to get involved with you. And I'm like, well, that's not gonna happen in the foreseeable future. So they're like, all right, peace. They don't say that, but <laughs> essentially. Um, so it's like, okay, that's their strategic decision. Um, so sometimes that can they, they can have some positioning like that that could change um, things. Uh, but specifically in the case of Keras Customs here, um, this was actually our decision. Uh, and uh, there's no, no like big dramatic thing. There was no fallout or anything. It was actually very amicable and, and, and it was kind of heartbreaking for us a little bit, um, even though we caused it. But basically, it's just sales of the brand have been dwindling and dwindling and dwindling for us. We launched it about three years ago, um, and it sold pretty strong out the gate. They had the Fountain K and the Ink, those two pens. We've carried them. They had those colors, and that's it. That's all that's ever happened with them over three years. So like any other brand, it helps a lot for any brand to be introducing new products on a fairly regular basis, changing them out, coming out with new models, because you all, you know, it's like you get a pen, you're like, cool, great, I got this pen. You know, a pen is gonna last you decades. It's not like you need to buy a pen like every month to replace the one you just wore out. You know, it's not a, it's not a consumable product, so to speak. Um, as if you were, you know, buying clothing or something that's seasonal and there's fashion trends and stuff like that. Pens, there's a longer lifespan to it. So um, for pen companies to stay fresh and interesting, you know, they might have a pen, but it's like a pen like the ink that they have. It's a very, very big, very heavy pen. It doesn't appeal to everybody. You know, they came out with the Fountain K, but it's got the smaller nib. So some people might be interested in like, hey, I want a lighter pen that has the bigger nib. Well, they don't have that, you know? They have that on some of their pens, like the Decograph and things that they're selling direct themselves, but it's not something that they opened up to retailers like us. So, you know, I think they've been introducing pens. They have a lot of roller balls and other things that, that we don't carry because we're, we're really just fountain pens here. We have the Retro 51 is like the one roller ball we have right now. Um, but mainly the vast majority of everything carries fountain pens. Um, and so for us, it didn't make sense to carry those other things. A lot of things they sell direct or on Kickstarter and not through retailers because Keras Customs is really pretty small in the grand scheme of things. Um, so, you know, it was difficult because we were having conversations with them over the last three years. It was like, hey, is there anything new coming? Is there anything else you want to release through retailers? And they're like, you know, we're having a hard time, but we, we can't get the margin that we need to be able to offer it to you through retail and charge the price and all this kind of stuff. And we're like, okay, cool, we get it. And so it was just like month after month we were watching the sales kind of dwindle. We would talk about it, we bring it up on a pretty regular basis, but eventually what happens is really everybody who's interested in that particular style of pen, they get the pen and then they don't need it anymore. So unless the, a manufacturer is kind of coming up with new and interesting things, um, you know, it, it eventually kind of saturates and, and it kind of tails off. And that's very normal, it happens all the time. Uh, and that's exactly what happened with us with Keras Customs. So uh, got no issue with them as manufacturers. In fact, we, we like them, they're nice people and they're American made and we think they're well-made products. Um, but the bottom line is 
us as retailers, it doesn't make any sense to offer something that no one is buying on our site. And it's not like no one was buying it, but it was not many people buying it at this point. So we've been thinking for a while, we were talking with them and eventually it was kind of like, all right, there's a lot of shelf space here. There's a lot of products that are just sitting there. We have money tied up in inventory. We just need to, we need to take a pause. That's what we, that's what we told them is like, we don't want to like sever relationships, burn the bridge kind of thing, but it's like, you know, we just want to take a pause on it and, and revisit it in the future. If, if there's stuff that you guys come out with that you think is good, we'll, we'll have a conversation about picking it back up. But for us, it's just like every vendor that we have a relationship with, every product that we have to manage, that's every report we run, we have to export all that, we have to manage. There's a lot of internal stuff that we have to manage for every product we carry. It has to kind of sell enough for it to make sense. And this one as a, as a whole brand was kind of just not making as much sense anymore. So we're very sad about the whole thing, but at the same time, we have to be, you know, um, rational business people too, because we are running a business and we're trying to provide you a service that you're paying for. And having a lot of products listed on our site that we have to manage that aren't necessarily things that you're buying or interested in buying, doesn't really help you out either. So that was very difficult. And we've had that, we've had this happen before. We had it happen with Waterman, with Parker, Cross, Schaefer, you know, some much larger brands where we were like, why isn't anybody buying this? You know, and we had to eventually kind of sever those too. So it happens, it happens. Um, it's difficult for me personally just to speak, you know, as a pen lover, you know, I want to carry everything and I want everything to be successful and I want everybody to buy all the pens they want. But in practicality, you know, us as one retailer, we're not going to be able to be the end all be all for every brand, for every customer, for every one. Um, there's going to be certain things that we specialize in. There's going to be certain things that we know and offer better, educate better, sell better, whatever. Um, and it's just not going to work perfect for everyone. And, and I'm very realistic about that. So um, we, we take our time with this type of thing. We let it play out quite a bit, but eventually if a brand uh, or a pen model or, or anything like that isn't, you know, getting voted with your dollars, basically, uh, we have to, we have to eventually say, okay, we're going to, we're going to take a pause on it, maybe revisit, see what happens in the future. We'll always try and stay on good relations with whoever we're working with. Um, Cause it's, it's very, very rare that there's like a fallout with any company that we have. Um, but when we do have a situation like this, it's like, all right, you know, it seems like strategically they're looking to expand more into the stuff that they're offering for sale directly, not as much to the stuff to their retailers. That's cool. Like mad respect, you all got to make the best decision for your business, more love and support. So if you guys want Keras Customs, check out other retailers, check out Keras Customs directly because they're doing some cool stuff. Um, but it's just not something that we're going to be having anymore because uh, it's run its course for us. So if they do come out with anything new that seems really interesting, please keep asking us about it uh, because we are interested. But, um, you know, it's not like a closed door forever, but it's just we're taking a pause. Okay. All right. Supercorn R on Facebook would Goulet offer Goulet gold nibs? Uh, we've been asked about this. So we have Yovo steel nibs. Uh, so why not Yovo gold nibs with Goulet logos on them? Um, you know, it, at face value, it, it makes sense. But um, the truth about it is there have been so many companies that have been moving to Yovo right now. They've got a really big backlog and they have high minimums for gold nibs in particular. Um, based off of how many I think we would sell, uh, this is purely just like a practicality thing. Um, based off of how many that I think that we would probably sell, how much they cost us and how much we'd have to invest in them, it just doesn't really make a whole ton of sense to be doing it right now, especially because there would be a really, really long backlog on it. Um, like I don't even know if we could get them this year if I ordered them today. There's that much of a backlog um, because there's so many companies that are, are kind of uh, moving to Yobo. Um, so uh, I think that it would probably be a long lead time. I think that uh, you know, the quality is going to be phenomenal. We have uh, Edison gold nibs, which are really good, but the gold, gold is very expensive. It's, it's harder to manufacture and work in. So we would have to charge, you know, probably at least $150 for just the, for the nib. So it's re it's really pricey. Our margins on it are not that phenomenal. Um, you know, as expensive as they are, it actually costs us quite a bit. And we absorb a lot of that margin to be able to offer it even around that price. Um, so it's, it's a difficult thing because, you know, if we, if, if it's not a very profitable pro product for us to offer, we have to invest in it, 
you know, way in advance and buy high quantities, it's just, mm, and we don't think it's going to sell that that well or that quickly. Uh, that's that's a lot of things that aren't really adding up to making it a really great product to offer. And it's like, I know it would be nice, you know, and sometimes, but honestly, like for what you're gaining in getting one of those gold nibs over a steel nib, like the steel nibs are so great. You know, the, the gold nibs are, are nuanced. They're nice writing nibs, they're nuanced, but like if you can basically buy like a vanishing point or a Lamy 2000 or something in place of getting a Goulet gold nib upgrade, to me that's a little harder to justify and I would have a harder time like really pushing that hard with all these factors involved. So, you know, it's, it's one of these things, it's like the behind the scenes kind of reality of it, eh, it kind of sucks, uh, you know, in, when, in, in what would seem to make a whole lot of sense to do. But, um, you know, I, I think a huge amount of it has to do with the price of gold uh, because it has just really gone up in the last 10 years. And um, it's just not nearly as practical as it used to be to offer uh, spare gold nibs like that. All right. Next question I have is from Savannah S. on Facebook. Does special or limited edition always mean you only have a few? You mentioned the Lamy specials could be around for a while, but then I wonder about the Banu or the Orange Ecos or Juniper Edisons. Is there a way to see on the website if it's low stock? Okay, so special edition, limited edition, um, or I'll, I'll distinguish those two. So special edition means that a manufacturer is only making like one particular amount, whether it's for a set period of time or a set uh, number or batch or whatever it is. And we usually don't know exactly how many pens that's going to be. Um, and, you know, I'll use Lamy as an example since that's one that's come up recently, you know, the Safaris. Um, in years past, we've had pens like the Safaris and All-Stars that often will uh, sell quickly out the gate, depending on how well we order them, how many come into the U.S., because, you know, Lamy's shipping all over the world. They ship to 70 different countries. So you think of all the pens that they're making, how many of those are going to each country and then how many are going to the retailers within that country or each region? I don't know if, I don't think each country has its own distributor, but um, you know, Lamy, Lamy Germany is not shipping. There's something like 10,000 different retailers or something. So they're not shipping to 10,000 different locations. That would be a logistical nightmare. They're shipping to distributors who are then shipping to all of the retailers. So what's happening is they're allotting basically a certain amount to go to all these different places. The distributor then says, okay, I have, a certain amount. So everybody kind of places their orders into the distributors, lots of logistics. Just think of how many SKUs and how many different, you know, variations and nib size and all this kind of stuff. It gets complicated, believe me, behind the scenes. Um, anyone who's worked in retail or any inventory based business, you know, it's complicated, especially with seasonal stuff and you don't know and it's a new color and how do you predict the stock and all that. Um, it gets complicated. Uh, so what happens is, you know, we'll, we'll place an order Maybe optimistic, maybe pessimistic, we don't know. It depends on the color, how popular we think. Pastels, you know, five years ago might have fallen flat on its face, but if it's more popular now, it would do better. So there's a lot of just, there's a lot of art as well as science into, you know, predicting this kind of stuff. So it depends on how many we order, how many everybody else orders, how many they have that came to the US, how many they can allot out. So we never really know exactly what's gonna happen until the stuff arrives to us, right? Um, and so it's very difficult for us because, you know, uh, we basically just, there's so much, there's so much up in the air. And then um, we don't take pre-orders on these pens either because there's so many variables uh, for all the reasons I just explained. Um, but what happens is we, we guess, we have, you know, a sense based on how, how much we're talking to you on the phone, email, live chat, social media platforms, everything, our own gut, everything, how well we gonna feel it's gonna do, because sometimes that's all we have to go off of. Uh, and then sometimes we're wrong. <laughs> You know, sometimes we're way up, sometimes we're way down. We can end up crazy overstocked. We can end up selling out in a day. It's really, really, really difficult to hit it perfectly. Um, so we, we more often will tend to, especially on hot items, you know, like, like the special edition type stuff, at the onset, we'll usually go a little heavy. And then, you know, hopefully not go so, so, so heavy. Um, but then we'll kind of like ride it out a little bit if we end up do going, do going a little heavy. And that's okay, I'd rather be that than like sell out in an hour and then it's like, shoot, now everybody's upset and you know, we can't get more for another month and that kind of thing. Um, so that's kind of sort of how it works. Um, but it really varies a lot, like using Lamy as an example. So there's special editions like Vibrant Pink and All Black, 
no problem all last year of us getting stock uh, when we needed it. I mean, they had some stock issues on certain nibs and things like that. Um, but and, and there were periods of time where things were better and things were worse. But in general, it's not like they ran out of pens and all that kind of stuff. We were able to order pretty regularly until the, se the season ran out. And then they moved on to the new ones. And now these are available and we got good stock at the onset. And so they're not like selling out in minutes. Uh, other things like the Studio Racing Green that technically launched last year, we placed a large order. We got a fraction of what we ordered. It sold out. We were told maybe more were coming. And then they were like, oh, actually, just kidding. This is all we have. Um, they had some production issues and things like that on the pens. And basically, we, that, that was all we got. Um, so it was like, blah, OK. So we were thinking that the Studio Racing Green was going to be around for a while. Turns out we had one batch that was a fraction of what we wanted. That kind of stinks. So there's so many factors. There could be manufacturing issues, distribution issues, you know, things like that. Just popularity. If other retailers snatch them all up and then that's it. Uh, it's really hard to hit the, hit it perfectly because you basically have like, you know, each retailer, distributor, manufacturer, all have to kind of predict how well it's going to sell and kind of hit it perfectly for it to really be right, um, which is hard. Um, so that's special editions. Limited editions are a little bit different when you're talking like numbered limited editions because then you know, okay, there's going to be 500 of a certain pen or 88 of a certain pen. This is all that's going to be made. You, We as retailers usually know, sometimes we can get a heads up, sometimes we can't, um, on a given pen like, hey, this pen is coming out. There's only 88 or say there's 500 in the world, you know, say 100 are coming to the U.S., and then how many do you want? And we'll say we want X number. And then they'll say, OK, I can give you X number. And it's like, OK, I'll take that. So out of the whole world, I'm just I'm throwing out random numbers here very generically. But say there's 500 pens in the world, you know, say we get 20 or something like that. OK, that's fair. There's a lot of retailers. Um, so we'll get 20 and then that's it. And we know that, you know, we'll get 20 out of the 500. We don't know what numbers we're getting, um, but that's it. And we know and then that's, that's kind of all. But the challenge with either of these methods is we don't really know who's going to buy them, how quickly they're going to sell, when we're actually going to get them. Um, there's so many things that are kind of up in the air, it's, it gets to be a real challenge. Um, so for you, as a customer, it's incredibly frustrating because we hardly know what's going on. And you're even further removed, so how would you know either, other than what we communicate? So what we try to do is we try to insulate you from as much of the question stuff as that we have to deal with and then pretty much we look to get it in hand and then it's like once we have it then we will choose to um you know sell it market it promote it whatever push it out you know it's like we'll have oftentimes we'll have ordered ordered what we thought was a big amount we're like all right we're going to put it in the newsletter we're going to put it on social media we're going to you know let a lot of people know that it's around and then we get shorted severely or you know we'll we'll get it in launch it for sale and usually for us the priority is like whoever signs up for the email notification on our website we're like these are the most serious people they're there they're on our site they're ready to go you know that's the most loyal group so if we're ever shorted and we ever have a question about how many pens we're going to have you know we don't have like a formal loyalty program we don't have a pre-order program or anything like that in place um, but that is the first thing that we'll do is we'll put it in stock and we'll have the email notification go out. Then we'll have things like the email newsletter, social media, all these types of things. Um, that's more of like, a, okay, if we know we have good stock and we know that we're not gonna run out immediately, we'll put it in the newsletter, we'll put it in all these other places. And we'll kind of, it's, it's pretty much like a daily conversation that we're having around here about what we're promoting, what we're doing, what we're, what we're um, you know, making you aware of because the last thing we want to do is take something that's really limited and then like blast it out to everybody, have it sell out in minutes, and then just everybody's frustrated. So we figure those who are most attentive to what's going on on the site and most attentive to our social platforms and all that, they're the ones who, um, you know, kind of get first dibs, if you will, just by just by being there. So that's that's kind of how we're doing it right now. Um, your question about is there a way to see on the website if it's low stock? Theoretically, that seems like it would be a good option. Like, just put the number of pens that we have. Um, you know, that that at first glance seems 
seems okay. What's challenging with that is we have different nib sizes. Sometimes we can swap out nib sizes and get others, so there's things that we can do. Sometimes we have follow-up shipments that are coming on some and others, so we'll get replenishments. And so it's, it's a very incomplete picture. It's literally just a snapshot of, at that moment, how many pens are there. It's not really gonna tell you if I need to wait till the end of the week to buy this pen, if I see that there's seven pens left. Some pens, seven pens is gonna sell in the next four minutes. Other pens, seven pens is gonna last three months. So it's, it's really difficult for you to know just by looking at a number or, or whatever we would display um, and know uh, exactly how long that's gonna go because it's just too many variables. And so I'm trying to like rack my brain and think because I, like, I do really understand from your perspective like how frustrating that is. And we have conversations about that all the time around here. Um, but it is so difficult just to even get the product in in the first place, let alone try to predict and communicate out how long it's going to be around and stuff like that. So we, we haven't really figured that out yet, um, but it is, I am very intrigued by the prospect of that, of, of doing a better job of communicating that out. Right now, the communication is largely related to, hey, we still have it, not, hey, we're about to run out. Because also the challenge that we have, um, which is just another interesting aspect of human psychology, uh, when we say, you know, last pens will sell out soon, you know, that will actually make them sell out even faster. Because if you know that you're not going to be able to get it anymore, you're more likely to jump on it, and so is everybody else. So if we have a pen listed on our site and we don't have a quantity listed, people are going to be somewhat less inclined to jump right in and get them. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if we list, you know, hey, only five left, it might sell out in one day instead of seven days uh, because everybody wants to jump right on it. And then it sells out way sooner than anyone else would have expected. So it's really tough. It's really tough. I don't have a perfect answer for that. Um, it is something you've prompted me to think about it a little bit more, though, Savannah. So I'm going to try to reflect on that a little bit more. I'd be very curious to know, this won't be my question of the week officially, but I'm curious to know just because we're here and we're talking about this. As you're having experiences on other sites, not necessarily pen sites, but certainly that's relevant, uh, but other just online retail sites, how do, how do you as a shopper, as a consumer, a customer on other people's sites how do you see that work really well if there's like limited stock and these types of things? You know, are pre-orders more common? That gets really challenging, it's a whole other thing. Is it a communication? Do you see stock displayed on other people's sites? Do you see just a general message like, we'll sell out soon or maybe gone in two days or, or whatever? I don't know, logistically, I don't know how to manage that, but I am curious and it could be a goal to strive for, at least as a mental exercise of thinking, how can we serve you better in that way? because my heart really goes out to you in that way and I, and I really hate to have so much ambiguity and mystery around it. Um, but as kind of a um, uh, fail safe, uh, you know, if you are really like seriously interested in something, you really think that it may sell out, you can always reach out to our team, email, live chat, phone call, social media, whatever. We're a little less inclined to post like blast it on a social media like Instagram comment or something like that because that like publicly kind of locks us in. But, you know, if you contact our customer care team, you know, if you're asking like, hey, how many of this do you have left? We may or may not be able to tell you, but um, we may be able to give you an indication of like, okay, basically, you know, we think we're probably going to have them about this longer. We can at least say, yeah, these usually sell pretty fast. You should probably move on it. We can at least give you more context if you contact us individually. It gets really difficult with, with very low price pens because those tend to just move um, because they're more accessible to more people. With higher dollar pens, you know, like the Titan is a $90 pen. Those people will be a little more intentional before they buy. It's not quite as much of an impulse, especially versus like a thousand dollar pen. Those usually have a much longer lead time, right? So um, we can give you more context and you can always reach out to our team and, and see if um, we can give you more information so you can have a better, better buying experience from us. Cool. All right, last question for this week. Elizabeth D on Facebook. Is there a rhyme or reason why some items appear in the new arrivals first without being in coming soon? I was taken by surprise when the new blue Montegrappa Elmo showed up without warning. <laughs> Smiley face. 
Um, yes, this will be a very short answer for you. So we have these two designations as well as many others, excuse me, on our site. Um, new arrivals and coming soon. So coming soon basically means, hey, it's not for sale yet, but we want to give you a heads up that we're going to have it. Um, doesn't imply exactly when that's going to be. Sometimes things get delayed and we have things in coming soon for a year or more. Uh, we try not to do that, but basically coming soon means we haven't yet received it. We've never received any stock, but we want to let you know. And mainly the reason why we do that is because we want you to have the opportunity to you know see the, see the product and whatnot, um, but also to get an idea on the email notification. So if you can, it shows out of stock on the coming, all the items on the coming soon show out of stock. You can go in, you can put your email address. Um, we have a list of how many people are interested on, in that email notification list, that gives us an idea. If it's a, if it's a long time, if it's going to be like, you know, a month or two, and we have the opportunity to order up, even though we haven't received our first order yet, sometimes we can place follow-up orders that all come in at first. That helps us tremendously when we do a product launch to not run out of stock immediately. Because honestly, sometimes when we when we first find out about a new pen, if it's something like a Lamy, like we can somewhat more predict, you know, uh, because. It's, it's happened multiple times and it's more regular. The Monograppa Elmo, I mean, this was technically the fourth Elmo that we've had, so that helped, but it's not like it's come out for years and years and years. Um, and, uh, you know, for the, f the first Elmo that we had, for example, um, the Rossi Chilegia, uh, that was very difficult because it was a new model, new color, all that kind of stuff. We had no idea how popular it was going to be. I mean, some idea, guessing, but no idea really how popular it was going to be. So that was a real challenge. So by putting something like that as coming soon, that can be really nice because that gets awareness around it. We can talk to you. We can, you know, gauge feedback uh, from you about if you like it and all that kind of stuff, and then use that email notification list to get some idea of stock. Now that one, okay, the monograph is probably a bad example because that was a, that was one that we had already ordered them all and that was it, we couldn't get more um, when we placed the initial order. But um, I'm trying to think of other pens that happen in that circumstance. Um, no, the Twisbees we usually get shorted, so it doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of what else has happened like that. Oh, hey, here's my other black eco. How about that? I just found it over here. I thought it was at home. Uh, anyway. I'm having a hard time thinking of exactly which pen we're talking about. Um, but anyway, for any limited thing like this, like I'll just use the Lamy Safari as an example. Um, so the Safari, you know, we'll order what we think is going to be popular, but if we put it as coming soon, you know, it gets announced and we find that it's really, really, really got a lot of good buzz, good hype, and, and everybody's really excited about it, we can place a follow-up order and then at the onset we have more stock. That, that, that could be a relevant um, relevance example. Um, so that that happens. So basically something, uh, why would we put it in, oh sorry, okay. so that's coming soon. Uh, new arrivals is uh, anything that has uh, launched for sale on our site. So it's, it's, it's not, hey, this is coming. This is, we've got this now. This is the newest stuff that we've launched. Uh, and we keep that, we, we keep it on a 45 day cycle. So basically anything that has launched within the last 45 days is going to be, we have a special like, um, you know, internal process for managing that. But you can, you can, if you look at that site, that's that page, you're going to see everything that's launched in the last 45 days. Um, uh, so you can have uh, something that is coming soon, uh, but it won't be in new arrivals yet. As soon as something comes in, it switches from coming soon to new arrivals. But not everything that ends up in new arrivals has to go through the coming soon portion on the site. Does that make sense? Uh, one example would be the Edison Nouveau Premier, right? Um, you mentioned, no, sorry, Savannah in the last question mentioned that Juniper Edison. Um, for our seasonal edition Edison Nouveau Premiers, uh, we do not put those in coming soon. Or, well, we, we may, but um, we don't because we don't put the picture up ahead of time, and that's kind of the whole point. It's more of a surprise. Um, so for things like that where we are not trying to build up hype in advance or we, you know, we, we know we're not going to have a, a, an image to display or something like that, 
the coming soon is, is a little less relevant. Um, so things like that might just pop up. Sometimes that is the case where we are intentionally choosing not to build up interest in it ahead of launch. Uh, so we won't put it as coming soon. Just as soon as it it's comes in, boom, it's a new arrival and it will be for 45 days. And then we start telling you about it. Hey, this is new, this is in. And then you're like, whoa, I didn't even know this was a thing. That, that can happen sometimes by our choice. Um, that's not always the case. It's most things we put it as coming soon. But every now and then we'll do things like that for, for our own reasons. Um, <laughs> another one that's not necessarily a conscious choice, uh, we will somewhat often have products that um, may be exclusives, maybe not. Things where maybe the imagery is non-existent altogether. Um, maybe the pictures were like, oh, like that color, I don't know, that looks, that looks like a really dark image. I really think it's gonna look different in person. They're like, maybe we shouldn't post that quite yet. Like we can get that in, photograph it well, get it listed on the site properly, and then not have to like do image adjustments at the last minute. Um, that, that can sometimes be the case. So if we, don't, if we don't feel like we have enough information in advance to putting it, it's coming soon, um, we, we won't list it. So, you know, sometimes it's a conscious effort to, to not build hype some, and hold back. Sometimes it's we just literally don't have the resources to, to list it as coming soon. Um, I think that was probably the case uh, with the Blue Elmo. I can't remember specifically. Um, here's the Blue Elmo, by the way. I have it right here. Um, I think what happened is we had samples of the material of this blue. And, and you know, because this is just sometimes how it works with manufacturers, especially when you're working like with an overseas, like this is an Italian company, they're overseas. Um, they may or may not be able to make an entire completed ready to go sample in advance for something like this that is an exclusive of ours. Um, so what they did is they made the whole batch or they, they, we had all the different materials, different colors. We picked out like a number of colors in what order we wanted to launch. If we knew like this is our third exclusive we've done with them. We actually picked all three of these at the onset in doing them because we felt that confident this was gonna be a popular pen. So we picked the blue back in, gosh, I think it was like September of last year maybe. Um, something like that. Um, it's just a much more efficient way to do that. You know, they were here in person. We met with them. They had all the samples of everything they had. They knew what stock they had and all that kind of, they could set it all aside and productionize a little bit better. So we were able to do this as an opportunity because we did it that way. Um, and so we had a piece of the rod of this material, but we didn't have a completed pen. So, you know, for something like that, and it's exclusive to us, they're not gonna go through all the time to photograph it because they know we're gonna do it anyway in order for their own efficiencies. They didn't make a sample completed and stuff in advance. They did just the whole shipment in one batch, shipped it over to us. We got it as a completed shipment. At that time, we now have the pen along with, you know, the hundreds that we're going to be selling. Uh, and so it's like, well, we're not gonna put it as coming soon, hold back the entire stock of it, and then make it a new arrival once we list it for sale. Like, we're just gonna list it and then it's gonna be a new arrival and it'll skip the whole coming soon thing. So that's what it is. So basically you kind of have a heads up, advanced knowledge if it's in coming soon, but sometimes maybe, I don't have any data around this, but maybe 20% of the time, we're gonna have products that um, just skip right into new arrivals and skip over the whole coming soon thing. But with that kind of stuff, we try to buy enough of it uh, where uh, it's not gonna sell out immediately. So ultimately you're, you're hopefully not going to miss out on anything though that will happen sometimes. Case in point, we had a Franklin Kristoff pen that we did. It was super limited. We knew we wanted to hype it down as much as possible because we knew pretty much any degree that we talked about it was just going to uh, more or less, uh, you know, make people miss out and it would sell out even faster. So that one we basically kept completely quiet uh, and just didn't put it in coming soon. We listed it, it was a new arrival word spread in like two hours and the pen was gone. Like we didn't blast it out or anything. So sometimes it goes like that. You would be amazed how much of what we do is dictated by the quantity of stock that we're able to get. But anyway, such is life of the retail business. Uh, my question of the week for this week, the official one, is what's the most recent pen you bought and how do you like it? The most recent pen you bought and how do you like it? 
Love to hear about that down in the comments. Uh, for me personally, the most recent pen I bought was the Twisby Eco Transparent Orange. And uh, how do I like it? Well, I kind of already explained it. I love the Eco. It's my one of my favorite uh, formats of pen. A little more amber than I thought. I thought it was going to be a little more of a blaze orange. But it's actually grown on me quite a bit, and I'm very happy with the purchase. So there you have it. Hope you've enjoyed this. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe. Check out a lot of what I talked about here on GouletPens.com. Thank you so much for watching, and right on.